Almost everyone has seen well-known photos and footages that captured the atomic clouds of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings. But you might have wondered, why are both the exact moment of the explosion and the fireball formation missing? And why are there only a few images and film clips of the bombings? On July 16, 1945, the first test of a nuclear weapon was conducted in New Mexico. To record the fireball formation and the atomic cloud's growth, state-of-the-art motion and still cameras were used, including high-speed fast-ax cameras, which could film at 10,000 frames per second to record the initial stages of the explosion. The plan was to take similar recordings during the atomic bombings of the Japanese cities. Aside from purely scientific purposes, they were to have visually confirmed that the mission was successfully accomplished and show that the United States now had a weapon of unparalleled destructive power. In the early hours of the morning of August 6, 1945, the B-29 Enola Gay took off from Tinian Island and set course for Hiroshima. The bomber was flown by Colonel Paul Tibbetts and his crew and carried the little boy atomic bomb. It was accompanied by two other B-29s, the Great Artiste, which carried instruments to measure the blast, and Necessary Evil, the photography aircraft with a set of cameras mounted on board, including a high-speed, fast-ax camera to record the fireball formation. But unlike at Trinity, the attempt to use the fast-ax camera failed. There are several different stories about why. One says that the camera operator, a physicist named Bernard Waldman, forgot to open the camera shutter before filming the blast. Another says that he did manage to record the fireball, but the film was torn or destroyed later due to a malfunction at the film developing equipment at the photo lab at the Tinian base. Another version says that the electromagnetic pulse from the little boy interfered with the timing of the camera itself. After the photos were developed, it was found that the fixed official cameras were unable to record anything, too. The Enola Gay's tail gunner, George Karen, was the only one who managed to take any official photos at Hiroshima. Immediately before the mission, the 509th's composite group photography officer, Jerome Ossip, asked Karen to carry a handheld Fairchild K-20 camera and to take photos and describe what he observed from the tail cabin of the plane. The little boy bomb detonated at an altitude of about 560 meters, or 1,830 feet above the ground. Its explosive energy yield was around 15 kilotons of TNT equivalent. George Karen was the first one to witness the fireball and the mushroom cloud growing over Hiroshima. Despite the small windows of his tail cabin and a gun sight that partly blocked the view, he managed to find a good angle when the plane turned a few degrees and took several photos. Here is the one which has become the most well-known. It was taken about two minutes after the explosion and shows the mushroom cloud that reached about 6,100 meters, or 20,000 feet, above the destroyed city. After Karen's photograph of the explosion was developed, it was printed on millions of leaflets that were dropped over Japan in the next few days. Shortly after that, it was published in the media. And here you can see a different photograph which was published only in 2014. This photo was taken by Russell Gockenbach, the navigator on Necessary Evil, and shows the cloud at an earlier stage of its growth. It was taken about a minute after the explosion on Gockenbach's own AGFA 620 camera, which he had smuggled on board the plane. This camera and the original photo were auctioned off for $50,000 in 2014. This footage is the only known motion film of the atomic explosion over Hiroshima. It was taken by Harold Agnew from aboard the Great Artiste, the instrumentation aircraft which dropped the canisters to measure the yield and other parameters of the blast. Agnew was a physicist who helped create and assemble the atomic bomb and was acting as a scientific observer on the mission. Having taken his measurements, 
Agnew proceeded to film the atomic cloud in black and white with his own 16mm Bell & Howell movie camera he had taken along. Another source says that Agnew gave his camera to Sergeant Albert DeHart, a tail gunner whose cabin provided a better view. The film was shot in three fragments. The first one was shot one minute after the explosion, the other some two minutes later. Nagasaki In the early hours of the morning of August 9, 1945, the B-29 boxcar took off from Tinian Island, with Kokura as the primary target for the second atomic bombing mission. The bomber was flown by Major Charles Sweeney and his crew and carried the Fat Man atomic bomb. It was followed by another B-29, the Great Artiste, which carried blast measurement instrumentation. The third plane to take off was the B-29 Big Stink. This photography aircraft was piloted by Major James Hopkins and had a set of cameras mounted on board, including another high-speed Fastax which was to have been operated by the physicist Robert Serber. As Big Stink was taxiing to the runway, Serber discovered that when acquiring equipment for the mission, instead of a parachute, he had been given an extra life raft. He attempted to get a parachute, but Hopkins ordered him off the plane at the end of the runway, where the physicist was left in pitch darkness. As Serber wrote later in his memoirs, that was truly idiotic. The mission of the plane was to take pictures, and I was the only one on board who knew how to run the camera. Hopkins' behavior infuriated Paul Tibbetts and other officers at the base when they learned what had happened. Tibbetts even decided to make an exception and break radio silence to chastise Hopkins and let Serber give one of the crew instructions on how to operate the camera. But the instructions and the camera were too complex, and it was not used. The situation was made worse by the fact that Big Stink set the wrong course and never met the other two planes at a rendezvous point. After Boxcar and the Great Artiste wasted 40 minutes waiting for Big Stink, they proceeded to their primary target, Kokura. Upon arriving, the crew of Boxcar found that the bombardier was unable to see the target visually as they had been ordered to, because Kokura was covered with clouds and smoke. So Boxcar and the Great Artiste headed for their secondary target, Nagasaki. The atomic bomb detonated at an altitude of about 500 meters, or 1,600 feet, above the ground, with an explosive force of about 21 kilotons of TNT. At the time of the detonation, the photography aircraft Big Stink was about 100 kilometers, or 62 miles, away so it wasn't able to photograph the explosion. The only existing footage of the Nagasaki event wouldn't have been shot without the initiative of Harold Agnew. Before the mission, he gave his 16mm home movie camera with then uncommon color film to Walter Goodman and engineer on the great artiste and Albert DeHart, the tail gunner on boxcar, instructing them to film the explosion. These were the ones who filmed the historic footage. The initial stages of the explosion weren't shot because of an inappropriate viewing angle. This unique sequence, shot from an altitude of 9 kilometers or 30,000 feet, shows a part of a condensation cloud caused by the shock wave. About a minute later, as the plane was making a turn, the rising mushroom cloud could be seen through a side window. After that, the subsequent cloud's growth was filmed. As Harold Agnew remembered it, he believed that the photographs and the films would be seized by General Leslie Groves, who directed the Manhattan Project, and never make it to Robert Oppenheimer and other scientists of the project. Groves frequently intercepted technical reports addressed to Oppenheimer, and was considered obsessed with secrecy. But this time, Groves failed to seize the materials. Agnew was determined to deliver it first to Oppenheimer at Los Alamos, and so he gave the films to a courier who was only allowed to later release them to Agnew. Groves ordered his men to seize the films. So, 
army personnel confronted Agnew and demanded them at every intermediate stop at Kwajalein Island and Hawaii en route from Tinian to the mainland. But Agnew just told them, I don't know what you're talking about. When his plane landed in San Francisco, counterintelligence officers came up to him and again asked for the films. He demanded that they verify who they were. This slowed them down, and by the time they could authenticate their identities, Agnew's plane had taken off. It worked like this until they got to Albuquerque, where they had Agnew nailed since the courier had returned the films to him. He told them that they would let Oppie adjudicate what was going to happen to the films. Oppenheimer had the film developed and copies were made. Oppenheimer gave copies to General Groves' representative and later personally gave the originals to Agnew, who much later gave them to the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. As Agnew later said, if he had held them until today and sold them, he might have become a millionaire. There are also still photos of the Nagasaki atomic cloud, which are much greater in number. The best of them was taken by Lieutenant Charles Levy, the bombardier of the great artiste, who took them using his own camera. Unlike the picture taken by George Caron, here the mushroom cloud is sharp-edged, and its white top, which reached the stratosphere, is highlighted against the dark background. This image became iconic after it was published by the U.S. government. It should be noted that the photos of nuclear explosions taken by Karen and Levy were the first ones presented to the world. The mushroom clouds they showed became the archetypical symbols of the destructive power of nuclear weapons. By and large, the mission to take professional quality motion pictures and still photographs of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki failed. The most valuable images of the initial stages of the explosion were either never made or lost. The only existing photographic records captured of this historical event were made by people who smuggled their own personal cameras on board the planes. Who would have thought that these images would become the only evidence of the first and, hopefully, the last use of nuclear weapons in armed conflict in history? <laughs>